show you guys some uh, sort of a, a, a broad overview of reaction rate theory and, uh, and some of the algorithms that go into um, that have been developed for implementing these, these uh, theories for practical problems. Let me start with the slideshow mode here. Uh, so just a note about this, uh, this, this title slide here. Uh, I have this where the future is a random variable thing, uh, you know, in part because I'm not tenured yet. So, so it's really true that my future specifically is a random variable. And uh, hopefully, hopefully that goes well this winter. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, what I'm going to give you is sort of an overview uh, involving all of these things, right? So um, I, I won't talk much about these kinds of things uh, or these kinds of things, but I will talk a lot about transition state theory, which is definitely integral to, uh, to this kind of analysis and, uh, and some of the methods for, um, for taking the free energy landscapes that you learned about how to compute in the lectures by Giovanni and, and Max and, uh, and then going from those free energy landscapes to rates uh, in, in really this bottom corner uh, part of the diagram. Okay, so the lecture one, um, which was today, uh, will be about a sort of overview of rare events and, uh, and uh, rate constants. And then I'll talk a lot about transition state theory. I, I love transition state theory. So, uh, so um, I know that probably many of you uh, work on problems where transition state theory is not applicable, and I will try to give you a, a, a view of why that is the case. Uh, but this is a very good starting point for understanding uh, the foundations of reaction rate theory. And I will talk a little bit about saddle search algorithms, variational transition state theory, and transmission coefficients, uh, and give you an example of diffusivity in methane hydrates. Uh, those things will come will come back again. And I will probably try today. Uh, because I've learned since I, since I arrived here that many people are, are working in uh, the domain of biology to try and reduce some of the emphasis on transition state theory and move some of these kinds of topics into lecture one so that we can make more room uh, for identifying questions like this. Which reaction coordinate do you use? Which really goes back to the question that Michaela uh, uh, pointed out. I, I love his quote from his talk. Finding the collective variable is solving the problem, right? So once you've got the right collective variable, everything else is easy. And, and actually, I'm going to try and show you that we can actually do that now with a with pretty good reliability for a lot of problems. There are still some things in the world of protein folding that are, that are far too difficult. Uh, but for, for a lot of problems, we can actually find the right reaction coordinate now. And then everything else on this list becomes a rather easy thing to do. Uh, okay, so... Um, so uh, that'll be the focus of uh, lecture two, and I'll give some examples there as well. And then, of course, uh, in the third period, we'll just spend an afternoon doing examples. All right, uh, so rare events. Uh, you already saw some examples of some of these things mentioned in the earlier talks. Uh, the basic idea is that if you just run a brute force molecular dynamics simulation in a problem that has a rare event transition, uh, then you will spend a very long time rattling around here in basin A doing nothing that's very interesting. And then after, after maybe seven years of simulation time, and there really have been examples of this, one paper published in, in Nature uh, a few years ago on the nucleation of, of ice from water, really took seven years of simulation time. Uh, all right, so I'm, so I'm completely getting off topic here, but there's a, a very, very cute calculation done by Michael Schertz uh, asking if a simulation takes uh, this long today, the best time to start the simulation? And the answer is not always right now. In fact, if the simulation today takes longer than 2.13 years, it's better to wait and start it later, and you'll finish first, right? So, so you know, the rare events, the world of rare events is kind of weird, right? If you're looking at something that takes a very, very long time, you have to really think carefully about how can you efficiently understand uh, the nature of that, of that process. So, uh, so that's the, the subject of this talk. How do we, instead of focusing on the uninteresting things that are happening here, how do we get insight about what's happening as this system jumps over the bottleneck uh, from A to B. And, you know, if you, if you think about the time scales here, we can really make a quantitative argument and say when we are in the domain of rare events. So if you imagine that you could somehow prepare the system up here at the top of the barrier and look at how long it takes to relax and come down off the top of that barrier to one of the two stable states, that's this relaxation time. I believe Michaela in his talk called it the molecular time, a similar, similar, uh, basically the same idea. And that time should be much, much smaller then the time, the typical time it takes, takes to escape if you prepare a system in state A. 
And, and this condition is actually necessary for, uh, for saying that you have a rate constant that characterizes the rate of escape, right? When you say that you have a rate constant, you're saying that I can, I can look at the population of structures in, in state A. It doesn't matter where exactly they are in state A. I just need to count how many of them are over here. And I can describe the decay from state A to state B uh, with one number. And that's because the details of where you are in state A don't matter. Because it's going to take so long for you to jump across to B that you will forget your initial conditions within state A. And so you can think all of these structures are basically the same. Right? From the standpoint of when are they going to escape, none of those initial condition details matter. Okay? So, so this is this separation of time scales argument that is required for talking about uh, rate constants. And uh, if this doesn't apply, then the full details of these initial conditions influence when they will escape. And that's, that means you're, you're no longer in the realm of, of thinking about things that have a properly defined rate constant. So quite often in biological systems, you see plots of free energy landscapes and the barriers are only about, uh, about 1 or 2 kT. And, and so in those problems, probably you're not in the realm of, of being able to talk about properly defined rate constants, right? So, uh, so you want to be careful when you, when you think about rate constants, whether you actually just have slow interconversion between two regions of phase space or whether there's actually some large barrier that separates them and gives you a proper separation of time scales. And, uh, okay, enough of my yammering on the importance of separation of time scales, but hopefully I've impressed upon you that this is sort of, uh, if you don't have this scenario, then you can't really think about reaction rate, think about things in the, in the framework of reaction rate theory. And the, the rule of thumb, is that the, the free energy barrier between A and B uh, should be about upwards of 5 kT for you to have a proper separation of time scales and be able to define a rate constant. So that's a very loose rule of thumb I want to emphasize because as I've said before, those free energies that we calculate depend on the way we stretch coordinates. And so, so the, the time scales is invariant to that, that whole, uh, that whole uh, aspect of the problem, but the you know, usually if you haven't distorted regions of your coordinate differently uh, too bad, um, then, uh, then, then that 5kT rule will work. Does anybody want me to say more about that, uh, the aspect of free energies um, not being observable? And let me, let, let me, just, let me just point out one, one little aspect of this thing, right? So suppose I have two coordinates. I showed you the nucleation results the other day, right? So I showed you something that looked like this. You had... Uh, the free energy is a function of the volume of a nucleus, and I could just as easily think, well, volume is proportional to, uh, is vol volume is just the cube of the radius, right? So I could instead have plotted the free energy as a function of the radius, and you would get a curve that looks like this, okay? So these two things appear to be very different, and indeed, if you, if you look at the barrier on the top, they have different numerical values. But what matters is the interval of volume that corresponds to the same interval of radius, right? So suppose I look at v to v plus dv, and I look at the corresponding r to r plus dr over here. If I, if I look in this representation, the probability of being in that interval is here. If I look in this representation, the probability of being in that same interval is here. These two things are the same, right? But clearly, dv and dr have different widths. They're di even different units, right? So, so that tells you that the, the numbers here must be different, right? So, so this is what I mean when I say that the way we stretch coordinates, this is just, v is just a, the same physical coordinate as r because I can always convert from, you know, with some shape factor. I think I'm supposed to know that. It's 4, four thirds pi r cubed or something, right? Uh, all right, now I feel a little better about saying the sum shape factor. Uh, okay, so, so the point is, is that all we've done is really stretch the coordinates of the problem and the apparent change in the free energy landscape for if you have a good theory of reaction rates, it won't matter. All these factors will, will completely cancel away and uh, everything will come out to be the same. So, so the rates when we construct a theory should be in, invariant to changes like this. And, uh, and the ones that I'll tell you about today are. Uh, okay, so, um, all right, so with that, with that aside, uh, you know, we always want to remember that the shape of this free energy barrier 
is actually not as important as the measure of probability of being in different regions. And that's the actual invariant thing. And because of that, the time scales are what you can trust, not the absolute height of this barrier. OK? All right. So let's dive right in and talk about transition state theory. Uh, this is a uh, somewhat of a qualitative slide that, that tries to depict the assumptions that transition state theory makes. OK? So uh, we assume that we have some high barrier between state A and state B. And we, we characterize uh, all of phase space in terms of a one-dimensional projection, right? So, so you imagine that, you know, even though you might be thinking about a system that has uh, 100 atoms and therefore 300 degrees of freedom, or maybe 100,000 atoms and therefore almost a million degrees of freedom, uh, we, are, we are thinking about this as progress along a one-dimensional reaction coordinate where we take all of those atom positions and compute from them a single number Q, and that number Q is our reaction coordinate. We, uh, we then say that if I take that reaction coordinate, uh, which goes from A to B, as, as Q increases, and I pick one specific value along the reaction coordinate axis, Q dagger, uh, that sets up a, a surface now that separates uh, region, the region in phase space that corresponds to state A from the region in phase space that corresponds to state B. Okay, so this is our so-called dividing surface, and it basically is just there to cut, cut, the, cut the phase space into, into two parts. And so now we make an additional uh, assumption, and that's that because I'm going to spend a long time in state A. I can say that, that you know, the probability of being here in A is uh, related by the Boltzmann factor to the probability of being here. And by the, you know, maybe another factor of uh, another KT up, I drop by a factor of E in probability of being at every uh, level. And that's just what the Boltzmann distribution would predict. And so transition state theory takes this all the way up to the edge of this barrier and then goes one step farther and says, OK, we've, we've assumed that everything is equilibrium probability all the way up to here. Let's go ahead and just assume that we have an equilibrium population of states on the dividing surface. Uh, so, so now uh, we're, we're effectively making an assumption that state A is in equilibrium with the population of states uh, that live on this dividing surface. OK, so, uh, so then we make a third approximation in transition state theory uh, that says that every trajectory that emerges from state A and crosses through this dividing surface will never return and continues uh, on towards the product state. OK, so that is, the, uh, that is you know, this assumption that you never see this kind of behavior that crosses through and comes back over. All right, so those are the assumptions of transition state theory. And let's work out, uh, work out the math. OK, so, so basically what transition state theory is doing is computing the flux at equilibrium because of assumption 2, the equilibrium assumption, that is leaving state A. State A is over here on the back side of this, uh, the, my depiction of this dividing surface over here. Uh, so we've got coordinates x1, x2, x3, and, and that's as many as I can draw. Uh, but in principle, there's a, a whole bunch of them. Here is this dividing surface given by q, q of x equals q star. Uh, sets up a sort of boundary between A and B. And we have an indicator function here that is 0 when I'm in state A and 1 when I'm in state B, right? So it's just a function of all these coordinates that tells me which side of this dividing surface am I on. And uh, so now let's look at, um, oh, there's one last thing I should mention here. This is a differential surface element, surface area element for the dividing surface. And that's the normal unit normal vector. Uh, pointing outward from state A. Okay, so with all that uh, established, we can now uh, write down what is the flux at equilibrium escaping state A going through uh, this dividing surface to state B. Okay, and it is it is given by this integral. So it's a surface integral. I'm going to integrate over the entire surface, the boundary between A and B, uh, and that surface is parameterized by this. I have an equilibrium distribution that was in the Transition state theory assumptions, assumption two, right? So I'm using the equilibrium phase space distribution. And, uh, and I'm using now the velocity in the, it, it's, it's the velocity projected onto this unit normal, uh, direction. So it's, it's just looking, you know, whether I'm, whether I happen to have a trajectory that's moving in this direction, uh, or that direction, it all gets projected onto this, uh, this component leading out of A. Okay. So those are, those are the uh, assumptions of transition state theory. You can, I think, pretty clearly see them in this expression. Why is there a one-half here? 
because I've got an absolute value on this velocity term, and that would count the forward and the backward trajectories. We don't want to count flux that's coming back in from B. We only want to count the flux that's leaving from A. So that's the 1 half. Okay? If you understand where all of these terms come from in regards to the assumptions that we made on the previous slide, then everything down to the end here is just math. Uh, so if you don't like math, uh, close your ears for a moment and we'll get to hear while you're not listening. Uh, okay? So, so, uh, I'll look at this rather quickly, but, uh, but basically I can write the unit normal vector out, out of, uh, pointing outward of A as the gradient along my, uh, the gradient of my reaction coordinate divided by the squared norm of my reaction coordinate gradient. And, uh, and so that now is, uh, actually it's the square root, the norm, uh, not the squared norm. Uh, okay, so, so now we have this expression, which is just the same as this one, and we recognize that that this actually is the same as if I had to, so I've got a, a surface integral here, and now I'm converting to a volume integral, integrating over all of phase space, and just placing a delta function now that says I only want uh, to, I only want to count those configurations that are uh, on this dividing surface. So we integrate over all of the phase space, and it only registers when I'm on uh, this dividing surface region. Now our Surface integral has become a volume integral. And now if you look at what we have left here, it is just a canonical average of the absolute average velocity of Q multiplied by this delta function for being on the dividing surface. Okay, So that we can write that this way now. And uh, by definition, this object on the left-hand side was the transition state theory rate constant multiplied by the population of structures in state A. So this 1 minus eta is just giving me 1 now when I'm in state A and 0 when I'm in state B. So uh, it's a, there are good reasons for doing it this seemingly backwards way uh, that I, I won't touch on in today's talk. But uh, yeah. Uh, so um, all right. So now all we have left to do is to solve for this guy. OK, so this term right over here is just the fraction of time the system spends on the left-hand side of the barrier. OK, so here is the. Uh, transition state theory uh, expression. We've got our factor of one half in here uh, that corrects for the fact that we took an absolute uh, absolute average velocity here. Uh, we've got a factor that tells us that we must be at the transition state uh, when we're counting these absolute uh, velocities. And we've got this factor that tells us what fraction of time we actually do spend in the, uh, in the reactant state. Uh, so this is a uh, perfectly correct uh, expression, but it's not a particularly useful expression. Uh, it's much easier to work with an alternative way of writing this. So what we're doing here on the right-hand side is multiplying and dividing by this object. Okay, So this is the probability density uh, for being at location Q, Q dagger along my reaction coordinate Q. Okay, so, so I've multiplied by this in the numerator here and divided by this thing in the denominator here. And then I can recognize those two pieces. This one becomes the conditional, uh, the conditional average of the absolute velocity along my reaction coordinate, conditioned on being at the transition state location. And the other term, this ratio, becomes the activation free energy inside the Boltzmann factor. Right. So this term means that we're taking an ensemble of, of reactants and we're looking at the reversible work to take that ensemble and transform it into an ensemble of configurations that live on the dividing surface. And this term is telling you about once you're at the dividing surface, I need to know how fast trajectories are moving as they're crossing through. And those two things combined give us the transition state theory rate constant. This is a, a bit of a more common um, way of writing that thing uh, that's uh, rather familiar now because you've got e to the minus uh, uh, free energy of activation divided by kT, and you've got a prefactor. Okay, so how many of you guys have have seen everything that we've shown? Anybody not seen transition state theory ever before? Okay, a couple people have never seen it. I guess that means by process of elimination, about 95% of you have seen it. Uh, so, uh, all right, good. So uh, you've probably seen this kT over h version, though, right? This kT over h with the e to the minus uh, beta delta G. Okay, that's a special case. This is a more general formula. You can derive the, uh, the I ring formula from this one, and that's what we will do, uh, next. Okay, so, so that formula is from harmonic transition state theory. 
Uh, and and so near a saddle point, uh, we're going to we're going to uh, say that in this idea of saddle points being related to uh, transition states goes all the way back to uh, Eugene Wigner. And so here is the uh, the basic idea. So near a saddle point, um, you know I've got uh, state A going back into the board and state B coming out of the board here. And there's a little stationary point on the potential energy landscape between these uh, two configurations. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a harmonic approximation of the potential energy landscape right here. And, uh, and we're going to write down Newton's equation, F equals MA, in terms of that uh, harmonic approximation. So, uh, so if you imagine that you have a spring uh, and, it, and it's uh, at its equilibrium length, and you make a, a displacement in a spring, uh, the, the force that you feel on that spring is going to be minus kx, where x is the displacement from the stationary point, right? And all that this equation is saying here is that I now have a multidimensional spring, right? Uh, so I've got a vector displacement from the equilibrium position, which is right here at the saddle point, and I've got a, a matrix of force constants for pulling in different directions, right? So that's what's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have a, ma a matrix of masses. Along the diagonal, you have the mass of every atom. And we've got a second derivative of those displacement, of that displacement vector, uh, in all of the, the different, uh, directions that you can be displaced. Okay? So this is a, a little matrix equation, and we can actually solve for the dynamics, uh, of motion over this saddle point. And, and harmonic transition state theory will emerge from this analysis. So in order to solve for this thing, you just, uh, insert factors of m to the one half and m to the minus one half. Uh, wherever, wherever you find convenient, which seems like it might be wrong, but as long as they're in pairs, m to the minus one half, m to the one half, well, all we've done is multiplied by one. Okay? Alright, so, uh, so here I, I, uh, multiply on the left hand side, uh, by m to the minus one half, and that reduces the right side to m to the one half, and brings in an m to the minus one half over here. This group is just one, sitting in between my Hessian matrix H, that is the matrix of spring constants, and, uh, and my displacement vector x. So we're going to uh, now define new variables. So this m to the 1 half times x appears on both sides of the equation. And we're going to call it y. Okay, so these now are mass-weighted coordinates uh, that, that account for the, the differences in inertia between different degrees of freedom uh, in a very general way, actually, that goes back to Wilson, Decius, and Gross. This is a great little book uh, if you guys want to learn the, the basics on this stuff. Uh, there's a, there's a little Dover reprint that only costs about $12. Well worth the money. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, so this now is my mass weighted Hessian matrix that I've, I've just given the new name HMW. And we can now diagonalize this guy. And you, what you find is that outcome, uh, 3n minus 7 vibrational frequencies that are, that are positive and, uh, and positive and real. And we also have one frequency that comes out that corresponds to motion along the unstable, the so-called unstable eigenvector with the imaginary frequency in this problem. And that one special one, so notice one of these has a negative sign in front of its frequency. Uh, we call it the imaginary frequency, and this, and this direction is the direction of the reaction coordinate for simple problems like this, right? Uh, so you can't do this for all problems. Um, it only is applicable when all of your transition states uh, basically funnel through a saddle point region on a potential energy landscape. And so, um, so some of the things that you already learned from, uh, from Perinello and Busi and, and Max, uh, are, they show saddle points, but they're on the free energy landscape. Okay? So don't do this with a free energy landscape. You'll get things hopelessly wrong. Uh, but when you're actually talking about the potential energy landscape, this works, works beautifully. Uh, and, uh, so let's, let's give a concrete definition to our reaction coordinate now. Uh, that is, uh, the that unstable mode direction gives you a number, and that number is a one-dimensional coordinate that characterizes how far you've gone along uh, the reaction pathway. When you take this expression and you plug it into all of the equations that we derived previously, out comes the usual form of transition state theory that you've probably seen before, kt over, over h, with a ratio of uh, the partition function for the react, or the transition states divided by the partition function for the reactants. Okay, so, so notice something I think that can trip up students in the beginning. Uh, there's no h bar in this formula, right? 
Uh, no quantum mechanics in transition state theory whatsoever. There can't be any quantum mechanics in transition state theory because the whole theory is based on the idea that I know I'm at a particular value q and I've got a particular velocity q, q dot. Okay? We can't know both those two things at the same time in quantum mechanics. So h bar here in in this expression has no origin in quantum mechanics. It only has it's only coming from the way we define partition functions that have this leading factor of thermal de Broglie wavelengths. It's just uh, in the denominator of that you have an h, and uh, and it's coming from the fact that we have one more degree of freedom in the reactant state than we do in the transition state. Okay, so uh, so this prefactor that people often think is uh, somehow related to quantum mechanics, we we could have measured action in units of kilogram meters squared and. Uh, the value of this would have changed, and the value of the denominator down here would have changed, but the product of the two things would be the same. Okay, so uh, so there's really no uh, no significance to having uh, an H uh, in this expression. All right, so um, so this is a, a little example. This is a uh, very very common uh, model that people have used in the literature for for a long time. It's called a bilinear oscillators model. It goes back to uh, to Robert uh, back in the 60s, I think he started using these things. Uh, so basically what we have here is a potential uh, V of some naive reaction coordinate x naught. So we're going to, I call it a naive reaction coordinate because we'll see soon that it's not the correct one. Uh, but you can certainly plot the, the energy as a function of this x naught. And as I move along x naught, the, uh, the positions of a lot of other coordinates are going to respond to where I am along the x naught, right? So here is x naught sitting over here as well. And here are other degrees of freedom that we call the bath modes. And uh, these guys oscillate. The, you know, they're, in a, they're in a term that is quadratic, so they vibrate back and forth. But the position around which they vibrate depends on where I am along my coordinate x0. So we call this a coupling between different degrees of freedom. And uh, we can make it a, a harmonic approximation up here at the top of the barrier in coordinate x0 and also at the bottom of the reactant well in this same coordinate x0. And that allows us to recover one of these uh, harmonic transition state theory kind of situations uh, where, we can, uh, where we can describe uh, the state quite accurately, even though we have, you know, at the outset chosen this uh, rather naive coordinate. Harmonic transition state theory will correct all of that. Okay, so what does this, uh, this coupling parameter mean? Well, when you have very strong coupling, your trajectories look like this. Uh, as they try to move along x naught, they run into a wall that the bath hasn't had enough chance to uh, to respond yet, and uh, and so they tend to vibrate back and forth like this. As the coupling goes to zero, motion along this coordinate x naught becomes independent of the bath coordinates, and in that limit, it actually becomes the correct reaction coordinate. So harmonic transition state theory will account for all of this, and uh, the first thing that we do is convert to our mass weighted coordinates. These are going from the positions of the atoms to these uh, positions weighted by the square root of the mass of that degree of freedom. And in mass weighted coordinates, everything simplifies. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff because I want to save some time for things at the end that I think will be a little more relevant to the biology elements of the, of the crowd. Uh, so all of the details are, are really in here. Uh, this is the, the matrix. If you go through and you diagonalize uh, or sorry, if you go through and you compute the second derivative of the potential energy terms in this Hamiltonian, you get a matrix that looks like this. I've non-dimensionalized my frequencies. And what we care about is the unstable mode at the transition state at, at the saddle point. And that's, that's this guy. And if you, if you look at that unstable mode, uh, you find that it's actually pointing in the correct direction. So the initial coordinate that we picked was x0 pointing in this direction. But after doing the diagonalization, the coordinate points in this direction. And, uh, and now, motion in this direction is completely independent of what the other coordinates are doing, and so it becomes an exact reaction coordinate in, the, in this case. All right, so, so some details about uh, other things we have to do to get to a rate constant. And here's more details. So everything else uh, that happens in here is just a matter of doing integrals. Uh, I trust that nobody really wants me to go through this. No, nobody wants me to go through the the labor of doing these integrals? Okay. So some of the integrals are easy. This one is easy. This one is hard. Uh, uh, but, um, but the details, you know, I've tried to show the steps, uh, never more than maybe one line or so uh, skipped between, between equal signs here. So if you want to learn to do this stuff, 
uh, you can go through and follow uh, follow these things. My understanding is that they'll all be posted on the web. And uh, um, so uh, at the end of this calculation, you take this factor, which is e to the minus beta uh, delta f, the, that Boltzmann factor for the free energy barrier term, and this factor, which is the absolute average velocity at the transition state. You multiply these two things together. Don't forget your factor of a half. And uh, after some cancellation in terms, out comes Vineyard's HTST formula. is a very famous result. Um, this is uh, using classical expressions for the partition functions. Uh, and you have a ratio of all the frequencies in the reactant state over the corresponding frequencies at the transition state. These are all the ones that, are, that have real values. This is the potential energy barrier uh, inside this Boltzmann factor here. And then you have this factor out front, which is the, um, the uh, frequency of motion along the reaction coordinate in the reactant state. So down in the bottom of the well, uh, that is over here, in the bottom of this well, you have some vibration for moving back and forth. And in harmonic transition state theory, that appears in the prefactor. And a lot of textbooks will tell you that that's an attempt frequency. It's how, how often the, uh, the uh, system tries to cross the barrier. I, you see in this derivation, if you follow this through, it has nothing to do with that. It's just coming from thermodynamic, the thermodynamic contribution from the width of that of that reactant well tells you is proportional basically to how often the system is there uh, from the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so um, so this is Vineyard's formula. It's a uh, if you work in catalysis, you use this all the time, and uh, and so if you if you now uh, use the the version of the, if you write these things in terms of the partition functions, uh, if you just look at what the expressions for the classical partition functions are and take account of the thermal de Broglie wavelengths that go along with them, uh, and the number of terms, out comes kT over h with this ratio of partition functions. When you're working at constant temperature and pressure, you get an additional term that looks at uh, the effects of uh, changes in volume uh, for going from the reactant to the transition state, and that's the Eyring's formula. Right? So this one is Eyring's formula, uh, which looks almost the same as this one. The only thing that's changed here is we've gone from the canonical ensemble uh, to uh, constant temperature and pressure ensemble. And, uh, and so this e to the minus delta g over kt is a uh, very, very powerful uh, expression. And uh, accordingly, Eyring won a Nobel Prize. I want to say just a couple of things about why this formula at the bottom is so useful uh, in connection to experiments. Okay, so when, when experimentalists uh, measure rate constants at a variety of different temperatures, uh, so we have here a, a prediction that KT, the TST rate constant is given by uh, KT over H uh, E uh, to the minus delta G dagger over uh, KBT. Okay, so basically what you can do is you can rearrange this guy into H times K uh, divided by KBT, and that now is your e to the minus beta uh, delta G dagger. Everybody's okay with me switching betas and, and, uh, and KTs uh, interchangeably. I think that's a universal notation among StatMech people. Uh, okay, so we can write this as e uh, to the minus uh, beta uh, delta H dagger, uh, and then we've got um, a, a, a beta T uh, delta S dagger. Okay, so we get some cancellation in here with the 1 over KBT multiplied by the T gives delta S dagger over KT and the minus and the minus. Uh, some, some, uh, some magic happens here and we get E to the plus uh, delta S dagger over KB, E to the minus delta H dagger over KBT. Okay, so, so now you have HK over KBT. I take the log of both sides HK over KBT uh, now gives me minus delta H dagger over KBT uh, plus delta S dagger over KB. Okay, so, so now what experimentalists do uh, is almost the same as probably what you learned in, a, in an early PCHEM course. Uh, you, you plot it in, in PCHEM, the log of K versus 1 over T, and you thought of this as an I-ring plot, right? And you interpreted uh, in the I, sorry, not an I-ring plot, as an Arrhenius plot. Uh, so Arrhenius uh, 
tells you that the, the rate constant behaves like this, right? And it's sort of a, an empirical uh, version of this thing with the theoretical basis, right? So, so this thing is almost the same, except that now the A has a definite, a definite meaning. Uh, we can think of the A as being the, the KBT over H E to the plus delta S over KB, except that this is now temperature dependent and we approximate that that thing is not. Uh, and we can think of the delta H dagger as being uh, like the, the empirical activation energy in the Arrhenius law. Okay, so, so instead of doing this, uh, what I think a, a lot of experimentalists do that, that makes a very nice connection to the theoretical work that we can do in simulation is uh, to, uh, to plot things in this way. They plot the log of k uh, times h over kbt versus, again, uh, 1, over, uh, 1 over kbt. And you again get a curve that looks like this. And now the slope is minus delta H dagger. And the intercept is telling you this uh, delta S dagger over uh, KB. OK? So, so the nice thing about doing your analysis this way is you know, instead of having these rather empirical parameters that are, that are not things that you can compute, for example, with density functional theory, uh, you can you can do the analysis this way, and these are sort of readily available parameters that you can estimate uh, from uh, computational chemistry kind of approaches. So, um, so that's called an Eyring plot. And it's a very useful way of making connections uh, with things that you can compute and things that the experimentalists can measure. Uh, OK, so, uh, so we. Um, from here, uh, we've got a couple of these little pointers now floating around. OK, so this one must be mine, uh, unless, they, unless, unless all of these things are interchangeable. Uh, OK, all right, so again, you know, I emphasize that this KT over H doesn't really have any uh, quantum mechanical origin. Uh, it's just uh, coming from Gibbs' definition of the number of states per, uh, per phase space volume. Uh, OK, so. Um, so uh, this is a little example of how you can use transition state theory with these kinds of analysis as a mechanistic probe, right? So transition state theory makes these very, very specific predictions about the way reactions will depend on different, uh, on, on the mechanistic details and on the nature of the transition state. So here is an example from a JAX article back in 2007. Uh, this is uh, Bill Goddard and Roy Periana down at Caltech. And they're studying a, a system that we are also studying. Uh, so it's uh, this, this methyl rhenium trioxide or organometallic complex uh, that reacts with hydrogen peroxide in solution, uh, in an aqueous solution, uh, to, um, to gradually transform these, these metal oxo groups into uh, peroxo groups, right? So it does this in, in stepwise fashion. There are two steps, and eventually you end up with this, this complex that is a very good oxidant for uh, some, some rather unusual chemistry that, that Susanna Scott at UCSB has been interested in, in studying. Uh, so, so we got interested in this and, and you know, went to the literature and looked at their analysis. And they, uh, they do these uh, very nice calculations where they, they've used electronic structure theory to look at reactant configurations, transition state configurations, transient intermediates, stable intermediates. And uh, you know, there's this whole sequence of steps that take you, here's, here's this configuration corresponds to that one. That configuration corresponds to that stick drawing, and that configuration corresponds to that stick drawing, right? And then in between, you have all these things that the experimentalist can't see. But the experimentalist can test them and tell you whether, whether they're consistent with what you're computing, right? And so the, the problem comes when you actually take the numbers that, that they have uh, computed here and compute rates from them, you find that the experimental rates divided by the rates predicted in, in the Goddard group are a factor of 10 to the 18 off, right? So 10 to the 18 is a big number, right? And, uh, and you know, it's common that people will say, well, DFT is not very accurate, you know, and we don't expect the rates to be, to be exactly right. I, I fully agree with that statement. Uh, but we don't expect them to be this bad, right? When, when you see a disagreement that's more than, than what you can explain with, say, a 5K cal per mole error or so, in your activation energies from DFT, you should wonder, you know, is there a problem beyond the errors that I expect? 
uh, from my force field or the errors that I expect from my electronic structure calculation. And so, you know, it, I would also argue that it's, it's probably not really coming from transition state theory. We know transition state theory makes some approximations, but again, when you, when you use more sophisticated theories and you go back and you compute corrections, they're not, they're not enough to give you this kind of discrepancy. And so, so you know, when you see things like this, uh, I think it's important to say, you know, is what I computed what really happens, right? Maybe it's a different mechanism. And so, you know, we went through and did this analysis. This is a very, very boring slide. Uh, but it's just to show that, you know, the, the difficulty in this is to lay out all these different pathways and investigate a whole bunch of them and look to see whether any of them are, are faster. They should be faster because the experiment is uh, much, much faster than, than this pathway we know. Uh, so we're looking for a, a pathway that's faster, right? And, and using the predictions of transition state theory to tell us that the pathway that we already laid out, is something, something's not really quite right with it. Okay, well, we did find one, right? So here is a, another pathway. MTO is uh, sort of recruiting water uh, to help transfer hydrogens from a donor to an acceptor within the same complex. And, and this actually accelerates the, uh, the kinetics dramatically. So it you know, may not be apparent from this axis. We're plotting delta Gs, they were plotting delta Hs, and we're using uh, KT units, and they were using uh, kilo, kilocalories per mole. Uh, but, but anyway, those discrepancies aside, you can take both plots and you convert them into, uh, into uh, reaction rates using all of these equations that are over here. And, and what we see is that this pathway that involves these uh, water-assisted mechanisms is much, much faster than the one that was analyzed previously. And, and so the exciting thing is that then you talk to your experimental collaborators, and uh, this is Professor Susanna Scott at UCSB. She did a series of experiments then where she actually varied the amount of water in the solution, and indeed, this reaction is water catalyzed. Right? So, so, you know, by, by really trying to make this connection with the experiments through transition state theory and its extraordinary capabilities for uh, predicting relationships between thermodynamics rates and uh, things that you can measure in experiments, you can really discover uh, the, the correct underlying mechanisms in these problems. And uh, so I credit Brian Goldsmith for doing uh, the calculations in this analysis. Okay, so everything I've told you so far is rather theoretical and... Uh, Maybe it doesn't seem very uh, ground well. I mean, you saw you saw this example to give us an to give you an indication that there are ways of computing all of these transition states in the high dimensional space. Uh, these complexes have some, you know, 20 atoms or so each. So we're obviously dealing with dimensionality somehow. How does that happen, right? So, uh, you know, you all got a map of Uruguay, and it's you unfold it, and that even takes a moment. Imagine now that you have to unfold it. Uh, a third time and unfold it into a fourth dimension and into a sixth dimension, etc., till you get out to like 50, 60 dimensions. And every spot on the map is detailed with the potential energy uh, for being at that spot. That would be a, a pretty high dimensional map. And there's no way we can do this with quantum chemistry, right? Uh, so um, when you're talking about making a map of the potential energy surface, uh, using quantum chemical methods. They're very expensive. We need them because they can describe bond breaking processes quite well. Uh, but it's very efficient that we think about how can I find these saddle points on potential energy landscapes in high dimensional landscapes efficiently, right? And what I want to point out is that here I've got, you know, nice clear day uh, and I can see that the saddle point is over there. Uh, in practice, we can only see what is uh, within a short range of where we're sitting right now because all we know is the energy, the first derivative, and maybe if we're lucky, the second derivatives of the potential energy landscape. And we know those are only valid over a short range. And so you can sort of imagine that the real problem is sitting here with a blindfold on and, and trying to find this region in phase space where all the trajectories go through, right? That's a very challenging thing to do, and many people have thought about it over the last uh, 30 years or so. And if we could get close enough that with our blindfold on, we can feel uh, where the direction of curvature going over the, over the transition state is, then newton raphson would do the job, right? So if we can get inside this little, this little region, then uh, I would start a newton raphson uh, calculation and it would converge to here. The problem is, is that that region in two dimensions is already pretty small. And as you go higher and higher dimension, it's become smaller and smaller and smaller fraction of phase space uh, that, will attract, that will be attracted towards 
uh, convergence to this saddle point. And so what we really need are systematic algorithms that can fault, do exactly the opposite of what a creek does. It follows the, the soft direction down uh, the mountain valley. We need algorithms that can follow the creek upward, right? And that's what the Serge Ann Miller algorithm did. This is Bill Miller back in 1981. Uh, he uh, came up with the first algorithm that does this systematically. Let me uh, draw a couple of pictures again and give you an idea of how this, how this works. So there's some equations here that tell you precisely how it works. Uh, but I'm going to uh, skip the equations and show you graphically what they're doing uh, in most cases. Uh, all right, so, um, so you have this valley uh, that, is, um, that is going up this. So here's, you know, this is where you don't want to go. These are the, the, the highest mountains in the Andes here. And, uh, and somewhere up here, you imagine that there's a, a, a transition state. And we're sitting down here, OK? So if I'm sitting in this point, let me make it here so that I can use my contours. Uh, what you do is you say, suppose that I took a hypersphere of fixed distance from this place, right? And I look now at the, at the stationary points on this hypersphere. I've got one here that corresponds to going up the steep wall of the mountain, one here that corresponds to going up the steep wall of the mountain. I've got one here that corresponds to the direction that the river flows down, and one over here that corresponds to the direction that you'd expect the river is coming from, right? So this one goes towards the headwaters. I think of everything in terms of hiking, sorry. Uh, OK, so this one goes towards the headwaters. And this is the direction that we want to go, right? And there's a, a very specific recipe for choosing that direction in these multidimensional problems in terms of the spectrum of eigenvalues of the second derivative matrix again uh, at, at this point uh, where we do our expansion. Okay, so um, so there are a lot of variations on this theme uh, that have come out, and they're they're very useful. So. So this algorithm is almost never used because it requires the second derivative matrix. But it turns out you can get away from the second derivative matrix uh, for at least most of your steps by using this eigenvector following algorithm that came out in 1985. Uh, the dimer method, uh, eigenvector following, still occasionally requires a Hessian, uh, that second derivative matrix. And so the dimer method is very useful because it never requires a Hessian matrix. And uh, and it, you know you pay a price for that. There's no no free lunch. You're doing more gradient calculations per iteration, but, but it at least, uh, at least gets you uh, away from needing these. Uh, and then I think that there's a, a really brilliant idea by uh, uh, Joseph Bofill back in 2001 um, that uh, I think could, uh, could solve a lot of problems that still exist in this area. Um, and uh, if you want a resource that talks about these algorithms in a lot of detail, uh, this little book by Frank Jensen is, uh, is quite good. Um, OK. so. Um, so another one that people use uh, is very different in spirit. It's called nudged elastic band. Uh, I was informed by Hannes Jonsson recently that he published an earlier version of this in 1994. Sorry, Hannes. And uh, and so uh, nudged elastic band basically says, you know, let's don't try and go out and explore the potential energy landscape looking for saddle points that we don't know about. Let's instead say, you know, I know basically that I have this reactant and this product. If I can make a path that connects the two and make the, the forces on the path vanish. So these, so we're specifically interested. So if I take uh, a path and represent it by a discrete set of nodes like this, uh, then, uh, then basically at every node, there's some force on that node that's trying to push the, the node downward in this direction. So part of that force is tangential to the path. Part of that force is perpendicular to the path. And what nudge elastic band does, and what it was the, the first method to really do uh, properly, uh, is to recognize that the tangential force is trying to take all of these nodes and make a pool of them in this state and this state. And you don't want, to, you don't want that to happen, right? Uh, what you want instead is to converge on a path like this, where I have no tangential forces. So he removes the tangential forces and replaces them with springs that keep the nodes equidistant from each other. And he keeps these, ten these perpendicular forces. And gradually then, what happens is that a path that looks like this, my battery just died. Uh, I have a solution for that. Let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, OK. So while I'm, while I'm going here, I will uh, we'll try, um, try to keep talking. So imagine this, this 
curve on the on the right is where we want to go to, and uh, we start with a curve that looks like a straight line or like this thing on the left. And oh, now I mixed up my batteries. That was I should not have tried to talk and do this at the same time. I'm a terrible multitasker. Uh, okay, so somewhere in here there's a combination of two that should be good. Uh, Maybe I'll get away with one with a half battery uh, load. All right, let's see what we've got. Good. All right, I got at least one of them back in. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, all right. So, uh, so basically, we are we are gradually transforming uh, a path that joins my state A to state B. Usually, what you do is you make a a, a linear guess. And suppose that the, uh, the landscape looks like this. OK, so over here I feel forces in the perpendicular direction that are pushing the path this way, like that. And the next iteration of the path will go to a configuration like that. Let me try and change colors. So the, the next iteration of the path will change to something that looks like this. And now the forces do something that looks like that. And after many iterations, you convert that goes through the transition state, right? And, uh, and so that's the basic idea behind nudged elastic band. It's a very, very powerful algorithm, extremely reliable. The one problem with it is that you have to know uh, every, you basically have to know where every atom from state A uh, goes on its way to B. So, so basically it's equivalent to saying that I know all of the information that you might get from a labeling experiment a priori, right? So you're basically saying, I know that the atom in configuration, does this make sense at all? Uh, so you're, you're drawing this, this initial path saying that the, the atom in the high dimensional space, that's the, all the positions of all the atoms, are going from here to there. And in order to specify that path, you have to say that this atom goes to this place. And if there's a methyl rotation, for example, on your path, it doesn't really matter which hydrogen ends up in which position at the end of the game, right? It, what matters is that you, you get all the rest of the structure correct. And, and nudge elastic band has to specify all those things. That's the one, the one real problem uh, with it. And, uh, and the other aspect of this that's a bit of a problem is that it, it doesn't find things that you weren't looking for, right? By saying, I want a path from A to B, you're telling it what you're looking for. These algorithms can find things that you didn't even know were out there, uh, but these are also somewhat unreliable. Okay, so um, so you know which is best kind of depends on what you're doing. Uh, there are a lot of variations on the nudge elastic band theme too. Uh, so the the climbing image nudge, nudge elastic band is very good at converging quickly on this transition state location. The string method of Van Eenden et al. Uh, got rid of the springs and the nodes and replaced them with a uh, mathematical reparameterization procedure. Uh, and the string method of, of 2006, I think, is a much bigger leap uh, from Nudge Elastic Band, where he basically uh, generalizes this idea to using collective variables. Um, so uh, I'm sure you'll hear more about that from Eric later in uh, next week. OK, so let's return now uh, to transition state theory. Uh, and just make some observations. So you notice here that our, that our expression for transition state theory involves integrals uh, that are over a delta function involving q, right? What that means is that transition state theory is a functional of the reaction coordinate that you choose, right? The reaction, specifically the reaction coordinate and the dividing surface that you choose, okay? So, so uh, that's a, a very important thing to recognize. Because it says that if you choose different reaction coordinates, uh, that is reaction coordinates that cut space in, through different, different uh, regions, that you will get different results. Okay? And uh, so, so it's really coming uh, from this assumption 3, right? Assumption 3 uh, can actually, so assumption 3 was the one that said that you never recross uh, after you cut through uh, this dividing surface. And this can be severely violated in many cases. And the extent of the violation depends on two things. One, it depends on the intrinsic dynamics. If you're working with something like a protein folding problem, uh, there is no dividing surface that you won't cross through many times, right? The, the dynamics are intrinsically diffusion-like. And, uh, and you won't be able to make uh, uh, assumption 3 correct for any dividing surface. But also, you can exacerbate the error in transition state theory by choosing the wrong dividing surface, right? So uh, if you choose a bad 
coordinate and a bad dividing surface. Uh, the extent of violation of this assumption 3 will be exaggerated from what the natural intrinsic dynamics already, already do. Uh, okay, so, so this uh, gave rise to a theory that originated with Wigner. Uh, there's no paper that says the variational transition state theory of, of reaction rates. He just, he just was working on a problem and said, I should do this, right? And uh, I, have, I have three minutes left. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my gosh. I, I got uh, about halfway through. Um, okay. So, uh, in transition state theory, you have trajectories that are forward, uh, like this one. This one is doing exactly what the TST assumptions say it should. And then you also have trajectories that are, that are non-reactive. So this black one is, is going from B back to B. This black one is going from A back to A. And this green one is actually a trajectory in reverse. And what you'll notice is that transition state theory would be fooled in all of these cases into recognizing that there was some contribution to the forward rate, right? So here, we crossed the barrier in the forward direction. Here we crossed the barrier in the forward direction twice, and there was only one reactive event. Here, there was no reactive event, and we still cross in each of these one time. And here, even though it was a trajectory in reverse, we get a contribution to the forward rate uh, approximation from transition state theory. Okay, so uh, what Wigner said was we should choose the reaction coordinate and the location to place the dividing surface along the reaction coordinate in a way that minimizes the, the estimate of the rate from transition state theory. Right? So the basic logic is that there's only, there's only one, two reactive events here. Transition state theory is counting six. It's always an overestimate of the flux through the dividing surface because of this. When you have something that's always an overestimate, the best thing you can do is take all the parameters in the theory and, and make it a minimum. Right? Uh, that's the best estimate that it can give. And this is a, a uh, diagram that I will skip in the interest of time uh, and, uh, and just leave you with your imagination to how this is, how this is done. And the one thing I will say is that once you've specified a reaction coordinate, picking the location to place your dividing surface is easy. Finding the correct reaction coordinate is actually very, very difficult. Um, so here's another, another diagram uh, that illustrates this idea. Uh, there is a underlying physical rate constant. It's always lower than the rate constant that we get from variational transition state theory, uh, which in turn is always lower than any, any uh, transition state theory rate constant that we could get for some non-optimal reaction coordinate. And so this is the idea. You want to optimize over all possible trial reaction coordinates and dividing surface locations to get as close as possible to the true value. And the other perspective that came out of work in this area was to say, you know, instead of imagining that there is a best dividing surface out there, I can take the dividing surface that I have and try and compute a correction. How far away am I for this dividing surface from the, the correct rate constant? And that's this ratio. Uh, we call it kappa. It's a transmission coefficient. It's the ratio between the true rate constant to the transition state theory rate constant for whatever coordinate you, you want to use. And this is a particularly useful way of of thinking about things, because now we don't really have to do this VTST procedure, which is very difficult. Uh, we can instead just jump straight to computing this correction and apply the correction to our transition state theory rate constant. So the idea is once you, if you can efficiently compute the kappa, and you can easily compute the KTST, you multiply the two things together, and you have the invariant quantity that's the real physically meaningful one uh, that is the, uh, the true rate constant. So how does this work? It's based on time correlation functions. Uh, you have an uh, initial flux crossing through the dividing surface at time zero towards the product state. And you look at some time later, and you ask, is that flux that was carried through at time zero still on the product side of the barrier at some time later t? And uh, some fraction of that flux will, in, in short times, have crossed back over to the other side because of transient recrossing effects. And uh, and so now you take this and you normalize it by what should have happened if transition state theory was correct. And so this gives you a, a rather, it's sort of like an autocorrelation function that gives you a, a plateau value that reaches that kappa um, value, right? So, so this thing drops from one. Initially, this is exactly the same as transition state theory. Uh, but after a period where these transient recrossings are happening, uh, which corresponds to the relaxation time off the top of the barrier, uh, you reach this plateau value. And that plateau value is the correction that you need to get the proper uh, dynamically correct rate constant. So this goes back to Chandler in 1978. Uh, some people were thinking about similar things before, but he really laid out the theory on how to do this. Uh, okay, so, um, 
So uh, a little example just showing uh, that we can actually do all of this stuff. Here are my flammable snowballs again. This is the methane hydrate. Uh, one of the things that people have been interested in, in addition to how these things nucleate, is how the guest molecules that live inside these cages move around within the crystalline lattice, right? So the reason that they're interested in that is because thermodynamically, the methane hydrate, the methane structure, uh, the methane hydrate prefers to take up CO2 and expel the methane, right? CO2 likes these hydrate cages more than methane. So that's a, an idea that has been uh, discussed in CO2 sequestration. People want to take CO2, pump it down into hydrate reservoirs, and allow this exchange process to happen where you turn a methane hydrate into a CO2 hydrate, and in the process, you should recover the methane, uh, which you can then use uh, for, um, for uh, hopefully not just pumping more CO2 into the ground. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, um, so this is the sort of molecular level picture of what's happening. We have a donor cage that has a methane in it and an acceptor cage over here that's vacant. And for things to move in the crystalline lattice, you, you have to have these vacancies. And uh, so we set out to try and understand how fast this process could happen. Uh, we've got our donor cage and our acceptor cage. Uh, we devised detectors to follow their locations. And also we've got this methane that is somewhere between the two. And if I, if I show a little diagram here, you run into some pretty severe problems uh, if you just use a linear coordinate system that points from donor to acceptor. I'm not going to show the diagram, but uh, take my word for it. That leads to a whole bunch of difficulties. So this sort of complicated uh, diagram, complicated coordinate system that is spherical bipolars, if, if you recognize it, uh, is, um, is one that actually avoids all the hysteresis problems and things. So, so I should point out that if you're doing free energy calculations and your umbrella sampling windows seem to be inconsistent with neighboring windows, right? That's a sign that you have a reaction coordinate problem, right? So I'll, I'll just draw that when I, when I did this analysis with the, the bad coordinate, and we'll say, need to say anything about what it did, uh, you, you, uh, so this is Q bad, okay? And in the umbrella sampling windows, as you already, already saw in, uh, in Giovanni's talk, uh, you get these little histograms that characterize what the local free energy profile is doing in this region. And ideally, these things are continuous, right? So this is sort of what should happen if it's a good coordinate. But what happens sometimes is that in this window, it looks like it's going up, and in the very next window, it switches and looks like it's going down. And then over here, you get some, some mess like this. And this is a sign that you're sort of converging to different results in different windows that are adjacent to each other. Uh, and if you tried to splice these together to make a free energy profile, things would look really terrible. Um, this is a sign that you have chosen a bad reaction coordinate. And that's what initially happened here. So we went to this spherical bipolars to get rid of one of these problems. And I'll show you that everything actually works out quite well. In, in this new spherical bipolar coordinate system. Uh, okay, so, oh, yes, if time showed the sign of a bad reaction coordinate. Uh, all right, I did it. Uh, okay, so here's the calculation. You've got, uh, first, a transition state theory calculation. This is the expression that, I, that we derived at the beginning of the talk. This is your thermodynamic contribution, the probability of being at the transition state. This is your dynamical contribution for the velocity of motion along this Q reaction coordinate that goes from donor to acceptor. And, uh, and, you know, one of the things I'll point out is that when this Q lives in configuration space, you can actually estimate this guy without doing any simulations, right? You just need to know uh, what is the gradient of Q and multiply it by the typical thermal velocity and out comes the average absolute velocity along that coordinate, right? So, so these things can be done uh, in some cases on the back of an envelope. I, I really like that. Never do a simulation. A pencil will work. Um, so, uh, so, uh, this is now uh, an example uh, of showing that, you know, once we've got the transition state theory rate constant, we want to know, you know, there's a big flat barrier top up here, uh, how much recrossing happens in the top of that region. Uh, well, quite a bit. You can see that the, the kappa, this uh, transmission coefficient uh, reactive flux correlation function drops from 1 down to about 0.3 or so before it reaches this plateau. And so that gives us a correction. We can now take uh, those rates, so the rates are the transmission coefficient multiplied by the transition state theory rate, co rate coefficient. We've got actually a whole bunch of these different hopping pathways that can happen. So we put them on the methane hydrate lattice and we run kinetic Monte Carlo. So kinetic Monte Carlo hasn't been mentioned. Uh, maybe I will say a few words about it in the next uh, lecture. Uh, but kinetic Monte Carlo is a, 
uh, a way of taking, basically, a, do you know the master equation? Actually, Giovanni taught you the master equation on the first day. Uh, so you should all know the master equation. And kinetic Monte Carlo is a way of simulating trajectories that come out of a master equation. Okay, So if you have discrete reaction events between states, you can simulate a long trajectory. Instead of doing molecular dynamics, uh, you just simulate the transitions between states uh, that would happen according to the rate calculations that we've already done. So, so now what this allows us to do is to look at very, very, very long time scales and extract a mean squared displacement as a function of time. Uh, from that, we get a, a macroscopic diffusion constant. And the diffusion constant that we got was 2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters squared per second. And this was just about a couple weeks ago. Uh, this was in 2008 that we predicted this, and it had never been measured yet. And a couple weeks ago, uh, Werner Kuz wrote, wrote uh, me and Bernhard a letter uh, saying that you know, he had actually measured it and he got 2 times 10 to the minus 16. So we're wrong by a factor of 10, but in the world of, of rare events, that's really good, right? So uh, you know we're depending on force fields to be, uh, be correct. And of course, a little tiny error magnifies things uh, pretty severely. So, um, so I think that uh, to close this portion of the talk, some things I didn't talk about that are very important. What we compute are rate constants and equilibrium constants for, e for elementary steps. Uh, what we measure are concentrations as a function of time. And microkinetic modeling, something that you guys probably all learned in, in uh, uh, you know, when you did, for example, Michaelis Mitten kinetics, that's a microkinetic model of the way an enzyme uh, accelerates the reaction kinetics uh, for, for an enzyme catalyzed reaction, right? So these things can get much more complicated than, than uh, Michaelis Mitten kinetics. But they all basically have the same flavor. You say this is my, my uh, bottleneck, or you make some pseudo steady state hypothesis on certain steps. And out comes an expression for the rate, uh, a rate law that involves these elementary quantities that you can actually compute in a simulation. And so I think it's very important that we remember that the link between what we are computing and what people measure comes through these microkinetic models. And uh, so, so their, their place in reaction rate theory is, is very important. Uh, often I find that what experimentalists want from me most is not for me to go run a simulation. They want me to, uh, to develop a microkinetic model that they can use to fit their data. Right? So, so it's a, a very, useful, um, very useful thing to, uh, to remember how to do. And the other thing uh, to remember is that there are also transport models. Right? So transport models link what we measure to what we meant to measure, right? Sometimes those things are different. Sometimes you'll find that people will report a rate constant, and when you really look into the details, you find that they had concentration gradients that weren't accounted for in their uh, in their experiment. And this is an example of one of those, actually, uh, where people were measuring concentrations in this gas headspace. They had a little dusting of catalysts down here, and we're assuming that this reactor was well mixed, and it, and it actually was not. Uh, so, so these kinds of situations are equally useful ways that uh, people doing theory and simulation can contribute. This is just an old finite element model. Uh, but you know, this is probably the only calculation that I've ever done that caused an entire experimental group to rebuild their reactors. Right? So, uh, so, um, so you know, they're, they're useful things. And uh, I think it's, um, it's a, uh, a good place to conclude. Thanks, Cam.